four, three, two, one. Hi, everybody. Hello, Welcome everybody. back to Dome to Home. Great to see you all again. We're going to give people just a few minutes to get signed in in case they're running late and forgot. Or and if your to friends aren't here, go tell them to show up to this stream. Send them the link. Make sure everyone's here. We don't want them to miss this. This should be an exciting and fun show. Black holes are my favorite subject to talk about on stream. There's so many interesting things. And we've had a lot of people asking about black holes through our videos. So I'm hoping that you all are excited and ready to learn about them a little bit more in depth. So let's see where we're at. We've got some people hopping in here already over in the chat. Definitely, if you're here, feel free to say hi in the chat. I see Ari Sprite back again. We've got Denise, who's here almost every time, and Kate. Thank you. I like my hair, too. We got Shelly back again. Hello. All right. Should we get going? We've given people a couple minutes to, to start up here. Let's do that. All right. So hello, everybody. Welcome again to Dome to Home. Really excited to be here. My name's Ramey. Below me, we've got... Nick. Welcome to our stream, everybody. This is our last traditional Dome to Home for uh, this uh, three-part series where we do three a week in the future. And at the end of the talk, we'll talk about more about what we're going to be doing in the future. But Absolutely. this is the last one I think that we're going to be doing on Fridays at 4 o'clock. Absolutely. We're really excited to uh, move into summer, but it is going to be sad not to be here on Fridays with you all. Um, Nick Bellomi is going to be in charge of all of the visuals you see over here on the dome. So he's going to be doing that all live. Anything that's pulled up, he's clicking on the button himself. Uh, we also have behind the scenes Jeremy, our question master, who's over there in the chat, either below me or below the video. So if you have any questions, go ahead and pop them in the chat. Jeremy will let me know and uh, we'll take care of them because that's what's exciting about having all these live streams. If you've got questions, we get to take care of them live. There are a lot of interesting things about black holes. So uh, be thinking of your questions as we go along or you can plot them in at the end when we'll definitely be taking questions or as we go, if there's a really uh, something you think we missed. Absolutely, because there is a lot to talk about with black holes. So let's, let's go ahead and get started, yeah. Um, so first off, we wanna know what exactly is a black hole? And that's a really big question. A lot of people really wanna know about black holes because there's such bizarre concepts that really spark a lot of curiosity, which space is neat like that because there are a lot of mysteries out there, a lot of weird things to wrap your head around. With black holes, we've got something that you can't leave, light can't even leave. You've got time slowing down. You've got spaghettification. See, it's so complicated, I can't even say the word. It's wild and wacky, it's a fun time. So I'm really excited we to be telling you about this. At one. Hmm? This is not a black hole, by the way. This, is, <laughs> this feels like a black hole. So black hole is basically just where no light can escape. So exactly how that happens can seem kind of complicated, but it's pretty simple. It's something that you're familiar with every day called gravity. You might be familiar with gravity. It's the reason we can't just jump up and fly into space. We do tend to come right back down when we jump. It's the reason we're all here on the earth. It keeps planets together. It keeps planets going around the sun, it keeps the sun together, and is a big part of how stars work. Gravity is a really huge part of our universe, and it's something that we deal with every day. And the way that gravity works is because mass affects space and time. So Nick, what have we got pulled up? So we're looking here at a picture that shows space as sort of a, a sheet, and they've drawn these grid lines on it, so you can imagine different, uh, you can see actually the, the warping that things that have mass, like the Earth, would put into this sheet of space. Of course, space is not a sheet, it's actually three-dimensional, but you can imagine this being sort of a three-dimensional warping. 
And you can see that the Earth only bends the sheet a little bit. The moon would do even less so. Here, I don't think they're showing the moon warping it at all. But things, as they become more massive, make a bigger indentation in space. And that's where black holes really shine, so to speak. Absolutely. So basically, mass does create that dent, like Nick said. And you have this sheet, and it's two-dimensional. But again, you do have to think about four dimensions. Four dimensions, you know, up, down, up and down, left and right, back and forth, and then time, forward and backward in time. It's tough to visualize those four dimensions. So we tend to think in three dimensions, which means we draw it in two dimensions. And that's just kind of how it works here. So we have that mass, it's affecting things. And you can imagine if you were standing over there on the edge of that dip, you might fall down, down in there. And that's how it works. You end up taking these paths here in this curved space like this. So, you know, the question is, what does this have to do with black holes? Let's keep going a little bit. And we're gonna talk about a concept called escape velocity that you might have heard about. And it's basically how fast do you have to go to escape gravity to get out of that well that we saw there in that little sheet. Probably so black have... holes are the most famous for the fact that light can't escape from it. So we're going to show you like something that's a little bit simpler than light first to, ex to explain it, this cannon. Absolutely. Let's start with the cannon. So what you can see here is depending on how fast you're throwing something, it'll fall down sooner or later. If I throw something really slowly, it's going to fall down pretty quick. If I'm pitching a fastball, it's going to take a lot longer to fall down. So that's what's happening with the cannon here. What we have is those red lines where we shot the cannon really fast, but not quite fast enough to leave Earth. It fell back down, but further and further based on the faster it goes. So with that green one, we shot it out at just the right speed so that it's in that orbit. So it's circling around that little dip that we saw before. What you see that blue line is it's past what's called that escape velocity, how fast you need to go that you can get out of that dip instead of just circling around in the dip. So then what happens in our heads? We can think what happens if that escape velocity actually hits the speed of light or exceeds the speed of light. At that point, you end up with a black hole because not even light can escape. And we don't really think about light as being affected by gravity. If you shine your flashlight in the air, the light doesn't just come right back down and fall on you or anything. You don't really see that in your everyday life. So it's kind of tough to think about. But that light is still following those paths in space and time, and they end up getting curved like that. So they end up having to hit an escape velocity to escape from anything. Light's plenty fast enough to get away from Earth, but not fast enough to get away from that black hole. So the question is, how do you end up hitting that velocity or like getting that escape velocity to the speed of light? So what Nick has here pulled up, we've got a few different gravity wells, as they're called, because it's gravity and it kind of looks a little bit like a well. And the more massive something is, the bigger dip. But it's not just about how massive something is. It's also about how big it is. So the further away from an object you are, the less gravity you experience. That means that actually when you're at sea level, you weigh more than when you're at the top of a mountain. So that just gets stretched bigger and bigger, depending on how far away or how close you can get. So you see the sun has a pretty big dip here because it's really, really massive. But it's also pretty big. So you have something like a neutron star, which is about as massive as the sun, but because it's much more compact, you can get a lot closer to it, which means that you experience a lot more gravity. So you can see actually the outer parts of that well look really similar to how the sun works. It's just as you get closer and closer that you end up having more and more gravity. And the thing that happens with the black hole is that it's so compact, you can get close enough that the gravity is just immense and not even light's gonna get out of that well. Yeah, you can fit something like 100 Earths across the size of the sun. And that's about the size that, uh, sorry, and a neutron star is only about the size of a city on the Earth. So we're talking about something that's so small that it's like this compared to like a city on the Earth, and you could fit 100 of those across the sun. So that's how tightly compact things like neutron stars and black holes become, black holes even more so. They're only a, you know, a few miles wide. Absolutely. So then how do we make something like that? How would we make a black hole? So like I said, black holes, it depends on distance and mass. So anything compact enough could be a black hole. Maybe if I squish the earth down to a marble, or maybe if I squished you down to the radius less than an atom, then I could make a black hole. It'd be something really tiny though. And it would take a lot, a lot of energy. So to make any sort of black hole, you need so much energy that you can compress it. 
enough to get this immense gravity. That's not something we can just do in the lab. That's something that requires trillions and trillions of times more energy than anything we can make in a lab. So you need something with lots of energy such as, what do we got here? A supernova explosion. We have Ooh. the Crab Nebula. And this is a star that completely obliterated itself in an explosion, except for at the very center is a neutron star, something about the size and mass of your typical black hole, but just not quite there yet. So this is the guts of this star spread all across a wide patch of space. It doesn't look like a crab, but that's what it's called, the Crab Nebula. Must look like a crab to somebody. <laughs> yeah, supernovas are some of the most energetic events that you're going to see in our universe here. And that sort of explosion doesn't just explode out like you see here. You can see the outward parts of the explosion. It also explodes in, so it's pushing in on its core. So that's how you end up here. We have a neutron star. It's extremely dense core, like that neutron star we saw before. But if you get even more energy, if you get a bigger explosion, you can compress it further and further to the point of it just buckling in on itself and becoming this black hole, like a, like a tear in space almost. It's gorgeous. So this is a really neat concept, kind of cool, neat, awesome, Raimi. How do, they, how do we know they exist though? With this here in the Crab Nebula, we can see that neutron star. We can pick up the neutron star because it is giving off you know, electromagnetic radiation, giving off things that we can see and detect. But we talked about how nothing comes off of a black hole. If you tried to throw something off a black hole, it would just fall right back down. So it's not giving off light, it's not giving off any radiation, nothing's happening with the black hole. So how would we even know that they're real? So one thing we look for is X-ray sources, actually. And that's why and, we're sitting in space right now, is because from the Earth, you can't really detect X-rays very well. The atmosphere mostly blocks any X-rays from space that would try to reach the, our telescopes on Earth. So we usually launch telescopes in outer space, above the air, and then those telescopes can look around the night sky and look for traces of X-rays coming from uh, very energetic things like supernovae, neutron stars, black holes. Absolutely. Yeah, X-rays come from, like Nick said, really energetic things. So lots and lots of energy. So something like that supernova that we saw before, the Crab Nebula, X-rays would be coming out of that. But then why do we look for something really energetic to see something that eats stuff that doesn't give anything off. So there are special cases of black holes when they're in what's called a binary system. So there's a really cool x-ray source, the first one and the first confirmed black hole called Cygnus X1. And here's a really neat picture of Cygnus X1 in x-rays. So what we see is something really, really bright in those x-rays. And what we believe is going on there is this. So we've got an extremely massive star here, and we've also got a black hole. And this black hole is pulling in on all of this stuff that's coming out of the star. It just happens to get close enough, it's falling and twirling and twirling in. Because you don't immediately get sucked into a black hole. Light just doesn't fall into it. They're really, really small. So the same way if you were trying to like empty your sink, it doesn't just immediately fall into the drain like that. It ends up spinning around because it's kind of a small target. That's what we have going on here. And we end up with what's called an accretion disk. A disk because it looks like a disk, accretion because it's the matter that's accreting, the matter that's falling into the black hole. So it spins yeah. around and it's a lot of energy. If you were to imagine actually trying to take like a, when you use that sink analogy, I think that's really great because if you were to take like a whole pitcher of water or a bucket of water and throw it into the sink all at once, just like how this material from this big blue star is trying to fall inside the black hole and is, it doesn't all fit in all at once. So it actually, it's like all that water trying to fall down your sink, a lot of it's gonna splash out everywhere and it's gonna be a really big amount of energy. And so that's kind of why we look for x-rays when we're trying to look for black holes because x-rays are very energetic type of light. And so this material is trying to all fall in into that sink, into that black hole at the center. And instead it splashes out. You can see kind of these jets coming out. You can see this bright orange light coming out. We think that these black holes are very energetic. Yeah, so the same way that I dumped water all over myself while dumping out a pot doing dishes yesterday, 
those black holes are really messy eaters. That stuff is going to splash out. And that's how you end up with those jets that you see there going up and down. So you have these extremely energetic sources. And so we look for the x-rays from those energetic sources and we know that there's a binary system there. But these are a lot of x-ray sources actually, big catalog. And some of these might be neutron stars basically doing about the same thing. Um, and some of these are black holes that we've uh, confirmed. You can especially notice that there are a lot in a line that lines up with our Milky Way galaxy itself, which I've highlighted here. So our, the own flat plane of our galaxy, as we'll see, is, is very flat like a pancake. And there's a lot of these white dots, a lot of these black holes and neutron stars lining up and down the plane of our own galaxy. So really quick, we've got a question here. We've got, Denise wanted to know, how close can you get to a black hole without being pulled into its gravity? So that's a really interesting question. Um, sometimes people think that the second a black, black hole is there, you're going to be sucked right into it. But again, it does depend on that distance. So you have to be at a certain distance to be affected by it to the point where you're going to be pulled in. And that's called a Schwarzschild radius or the event horizon. And that's that point where the escape velocity reaches the speed of light. So actually, if you were to replace the sun and put in the center of the sun a black hole, but had the same mass as the sun, the Earth would just keep orbiting like normal because it's at that same distance. So you have to be fairly close to, to get to one of those, but it does depend a lot on the mass. If it were something really, 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 really massive, like millions of times the mass of the sun, put it the sun, the Earth would definitely be affected and start coming in a little bit more. So we had another question. Ari Sprite wanted to know, when did people first figure out about black holes? Were they theoretical first and then confirmed with x-ray? Yes. So the first idea about like black holes came from Einstein's general relativity. From that question of, can the escape velocity re like reach the speed of light? What sort of object would do that? Um, so this man, Carl Schwarzschild, we talked about Schwarzschild radius. He found a solution uh, which describes the gravitational field of point mass, which is basically, it's a point, an infinitesimally small point with mass. And that's what a black hole is. Um, and that's kind of how they sort of started putting together how a black hole might work. So that Cygnus X1 was the first black hole that was ever really detected and confirmed. And it was actually a pretty big subject of debate because they saw the x-ray and they thought that'd be pretty neat if it was a black hole. A lot of the stuff kind of seems to confirm with what a black hole might be doing in a binary system like that. And there was, there was a bet, right, Nick? Yeah, there was a bet between, uh, I think it was Stephen Hawking and was it Kip Thorne? Yeah. Um, who, see, of course, Kip Thorne just won a Nobel Prize for uh, some of his groundbreaking work on uh, black holes, which we'll talk about in a second. But uh, Stephen Hawking, we all know as being the smarty pants that he is or was. Um, and he's, he had a bet saying, I think that this is going to be a black hole. And uh, Kip Thorne said, no, I, I don't think it will be. And uh, eventually the evidence was overwhelmingly uh, that this had to be something so small and compact that there's no other explanation. It had to be a black hole. Yeah, I think it was Hawking on the bet. I think it was the other way around that Stephen Hawking around? said, like, no, it's it's oh, not a black right. hole because he decided he wins either way. Either he wins the bet and it wasn't a black hole or he loses the bet and it's really cool because it was a black hole. There we go. Yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. Okay. So there's a there's a fun little story. So we were thinking about black holes for a really long time before we confirmed one in the 70s. And then we've been kind of going from there. Um, so another way. Just uh, to keep going. Oh, for go the record, it. that is not an actual picture of a black hole, right? So what we are showing yes. is the X1, that's just uh, an artist concept. So it's not like that was a picture and then Kip Thorne won the bet. That's not how it worked. It was more of an yeah, no. Yeah, so that, that one's a drawing, <laughs> just, to, just to make sure. Just so make there sure. is another really good way that we can detect um, black holes, these stellar mass black holes, uh, through mergers with something called gravitational waves. So just a moment ago, I mentioned, um, you know, we have general relativity from Einstein was theorized in 1915, and he had this idea of gravitational waves, which is kind of the same way that you have a ripple on a pond when you throw a rock in. You can have ripples in space time from gravity doing weird things. And it took 100 years to detect them, but we did finally detect them. And what Nick has here is a computer simulation 
of two black holes. And you can see there's nothing coming from the black holes and you've got this weird distortion from the light kind of bending strange around them. Um, and they're merging. And it's such an intense event as they circle around and merge that it ends up making these waves. And it's something really, really small and difficult to detect, especially from so far away here on Earth. So yeah, you can see again in the video them circling around each other and making these big waves, these big distortions in space time. And it took a really long time for us to be able to detect them. Um, but in 2015, finally LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory uh, was able to uh, actually detect these waves, kind of like in this picture right here, you can see it's just a still image um, of the two black holes and those are the waves. So that's another way that we can find black holes. We look for those mergers, we look for those waves, we, we listen for them really. Um, and that's a really new field, really exciting to kind of be a part of astronomy uh, going this direction. It's really cool. Yeah, gravitational waves uh, have been on that forefront for astronomy for a hundred years, right? Currently everything astronomers do is they look at light. But if you can look at things through gravity, it sounds really complicated. And so that's going to unlock new ways for astronomers to learn about the universe, not just through light, but through gravity. It's really cool. And it comes not just from black hole mergers, also neutron star mergers, just for the record. Or black um, hole neutron star mergers. Neat stuff. <laughs> so let's get a little further from Earth here. Everybody say bye, Earth. Bye, Earth. There goes the orbit of the moon, and we'll see the orbits of the other planets, our whole solar system. So now, we're gonna, what we're going to do is <laughs> we're going to travel through the galaxy and fly uh, so far away that first we'll stop at where the nearest black hole would be. It's about a thousand light years away. And Cygnus X1 is something like, I think it's like 3,000 light years away, maybe 2,000 light years away. Yeah. So we're going to leave home real quick. Much, much, much faster than the speed of light, so we don't get drawn into any black holes. And we believe that there are millions, perhaps even a billion black holes in our galaxy, because as long as there have been large mass stars dying, there have been black holes being made. So we can't see them all, but we do believe that there are many, many black holes. For being such an odd object, they're fairly common. So about here is the uh, distance to the nearest black hole. You see that we've flown past millions of stars. We're only visualizing about 100,000 in our simulation here, but really we would have flown past an uncountable number of stars just to get to the nearest black hole we've detected so far. Um, and I'm gonna highlight where the sun is so we don't totally lose sense of where we came from. There it is, way off in the distance. You would not be able to see it from here. And then about twice, three times that far is the distance to Cygnus X1. And uh, I'll bring that up too. So the reason I want to get really, really far away from home is because there are in fact two types of black holes. There are the stellar mass black holes, which I've been talking to up until now. And sorry, a fly just buzzed past me and it freaked me out. <laughs> and there are something called supermassive black holes, um, which are about what they sound like. They're super massive. So while you have stellar mass black holes, that'll be a few times the mass of the sun, maybe up to a few dozen times the mass of the sun, you have these supermassive black holes that can be millions or even billions of times the mass of our sun. And you may have heard about one of them, which is in the center of our Milky Way, which I believe we can journey to. Oh yeah, let's do that right now. So the center is obvious, it's that big bright bar in the middle of our spiral galaxy. And we're going to trek there, again, at much faster than the speed of light. Here we go, diving deep into the core of our galaxy. So you'll notice that as we went into um, that center of our galaxy, what looked like a really large, just yellow structure was a lot of other things. They're just close together, so it kind of looks like it's one big object. As we come here, we're getting really, really close. 
And what we have highlighted here are orbits of stars that are really, really close to the center of our galaxy. You can see they've got some really interesting orbits going around. And as they get closer to the center, they go really fast. And as they get further away, they start going kind of slower. And that's how things work is they're orbiting. Same thing happens with planets. Uh, but these stars are orbiting nothing. If you look right in the center, you don't see anything. There is absolutely nothing there. These are orbits that we didn't just kind of make up to make it look cool. These are actual orbits of stars that we have tracked. I think we have the video for that. Yeah. We go. So in this case, the center we're labeling with this white star. So what we saw are all these stars and you can see uh, the year up in the top corner there when exactly um, the data was taken. They're moving really fast and they're moving around nothing and that nothing is really small and compact based on the orbits of these stars. So when we work out all the math, um, because you can tell how massive something is based on how things around it are moving, when we work out all that math, we find out that it is millions, maybe four million times the mass of our sun, but in a very, very tiny, tiny space, about around to the er orbit of Mercury, right? Yeah, uh, only about a third of the way from the sun to the earth. Yeah. So in this so case, I'm going to add something there. Mm -hmm. So I've added the center as a big black hole. Um, but the real size of something in this spot is so small and tiny that we have to fly really close to see it. So we think of black holes as being extremely, extremely large. And some of them are very large, um, but they're not quite as large as we seem to think. You can still fit it. In our, in our solar system here, this one. Um, so we found that and the direction that it's in, in our um, sky is toward the constellation of Sagittarius. So we called this object Sagittarius A star. Star means exciting, it really mm -hmm. does mean exciting. That's why they added it there. And we've confirmed this as being a black hole because the only thing that could be that massive in that small amount of space is a black hole. So if you, if you crammed enough mass in that space, it would definitely collapse into a black hole. Uh, for scale, we're just going to add the sun really quickly so you can see that the sun is a you know, massive light-bringing star and uh, pretty small compared to this supermassive black hole. Most black holes, remember, are the size of a city. This one is much larger than even our own sun. So imagine that sun four million times and then crammed into that small area. So black holes are actually not necessarily just about mass, they're also about being small compared to that mass. Um, so we've got that black hole at the center of our galaxy, but it's not the only supermassive black hole out there. In fact, we believe most galaxies do have a supermassive black hole in their centers. So let's go back out of our galaxy. Ooh, there we go. And take a look at some of our nearby galaxies that undoubtedly have black holes in their centers. Here we've labeled a number of them. We can see the large and small clouds of Magellan right off the bottom of the Milky Way. And I'm going to show a lot more because there are an extremely uh, large number of galaxies in our universe, most of which we think have black holes at their center. So we're going to have lots of little dots, each representing a galaxy. And maybe we can show some pictures for them. Ooh, we made we the pictures a bit bigger so that we can see them. A bit, a bit more. But yeah, each of these is an actual galaxy, not just a cool thing that we put in our system to look neat. It looks neat because it's true. Yeah, we really have this data. Uh, we don't know what the picture is for every single one. We, I, we haven't registered a picture for every single one that's accurate. A lot of them are still dots. Um, but here's a big chunk of them. This is actually called the Virgo supercluster, and conveniently, we're right near it. There happens to be a very famous black hole in this one. Tell them about it, Amy. I will absolutely tell them about it. So a really famous black hole, and you might remember hearing about it about a year or so ago, um, the galaxy called M87. So M87 has a super, super massive black hole, one of the largest supermassive, or the most massive supermassive black holes that we know of. Here's a great picture of the whole galaxy of M87. Do you see that little jet spraying off there? That's from um, the black hole itself. So remember when we saw that picture of Cygnus X1 and it had that jet popping up 
And that's kind of how we saw it. This is what's happening here too, is just because this black hole is bigger, more massive, doesn't mean it's, uh, it's got any better table manners there. It's still a messy eater and it's still shooting off those jets. So that's the jet that we're seeing from here. The reason we don't see one from Sagittarius A star in our galaxy is because it's not eating right now. This one is definitely eating though. And you can see in that picture there, which is in radio waves, just how immense that jet is. And remember that that bit of light is the entire, it's, it's the galaxy. So that's how big that jet is. So this is a pretty famous picture in and of itself, but there's potentially a more famous one. And it came out about a year ago, like I said, of the black hole in the center itself. So we've got a really nice telescope here has taken that picture, but we got a picture of the actual black hole at the center. And the question is, how did we get a picture of something that's so relatively small, really? What we had to do to get this picture is have a telescope that could see a quarter on the moon or a grain of rice from the distance between you know, Los Angeles and New York. So to do that, we built a really giant telescope the size of the Earth called the Event Horizon Telescope. But you might not remember seeing a giant telescope the size of the Earth anytime soon. What it is is a network of telescopes around the world, which you can see here. And by building a network of telescopes, you can actually use it like one large telescope. In fact, some of these are actually arrays themselves, a bunch of smaller telescopes built to imitate a larger telescope. So by having these so far away, I mean, we've got the South Pole, Hawaii, Spain, they're all over. Uh, we've managed to basically create a telescope the size of the Earth, and we're adding more and more to take better and better pictures um, with this Event Horizon Telescope. So by using all this, we managed to get that black hole picture, which is absolutely gorgeous, in my opinion. A plus work. <laughs> there it is again. Looks like the eye of Sauron. <laughs> it does. It does look like the Eye of Sauron. We're really happy Eskimo. Yeah. So uh, what we see here is not actually the black hole, because like we've said a number of times, you can't actually see a black hole because there's no light coming from it. But remember before what we were looking at were those jets and were those accretion disks, which we've got another picture of here. Um, so what we're seeing is the light coming off of those accretion disks. Um, but we're not seeing it just that kind of side on like this. What we're seeing is the light kind of bending around it. So we're not just seeing an accretion disk like this drawing. The light gets bent around. I think we have a pretty good video of that, actually. Yes, we do. This is one of my favorite videos in the whole world. Let's check it out. So what you've got going on here are those yellow lines are supposed to be like beams of light. And you've got that black hole in the middle, which is supposed to be, you guessed it, a black hole. And you see the light that's coming from behind is getting bent around it. So you can actually see light behind an object. Really what you're seeing more is the shadow of the black hole when we look at that picture. So we're looking at that accretion disk, but also kind of distorted. And that's why you have a part of that accretion disk does um, look brighter than another part of it. You can see right there, the bottom part. And that's the stuff that's toward us, the stuff that's a little bit less bright is stuff behind the black hole. So that's what we're seeing in that picture. And by taking that picture, we managed to find a lot of really cool information. For example, that black hole is six and a half billion times the mass of our sun. It's got the mass of a small galaxy, but All it's about- inside this, of, yeah, you tell yeah. them. Yeah, you can fit that um, around the size of our solar system, yeah? Uh, yeah, that this is uh, about 120 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Mm -hmm. So it's about three times further than the orbit of Neptune, a little bit bigger than our own uh, solar system, depending on where you put the edge. So you've managed to mush in an entire small galaxy into just barely bigger than our solar system, which is... Absolutely incredible. We've got a couple of questions here. Um, we've got Colin wants to know, does every galaxy have a black hole at its center? Most likely um, every galaxy we've been looking at does have one. So we're kind of extrapolating from there, um, which is super neat and leads to a lot of questions as to why every galaxy has the supermassive black hole in the center. Does it happen because there's a galaxy or does a galaxy happen because there's a black hole? 
It's a really big open area of research, which is a really cool mystery for if anybody wants to go into astronomy or is going into astronomy, that these are the kind of mysteries that we still get to work on. You know, we often think that astronomy has everything solved, science has a lot of things solved. We still have a ton of mysteries like this to, to work on. Since we're talking about the Event Horizon Telescope, really quick, I just wanted to show the most recent picture from the Event Horizon Telescope. It didn't get quite as much media attention because it's a little tougher. So this is a picture of what's called a quasar. And a quasar, which means quasi-stellar object, is what that came from. It has nothing to do with stars, though. It's a galaxy that's extremely far away, and it's really, really bright due to its um, due to a supermassive black hole in the center that has really, really bright jets, really, really energetic, actively eating. So what we've got here with that Event Horizon Telescope took the data around the same time um, as they did uh, of M87, and we can see the jets there. Uh, coming off it. And that was some pretty exciting data they're still working with. The jets were actually a lot more spirally than they thought they would be. Um, so again, more big mysteries that we get to work on with astronomy. And that's kind of how the future of black holes is looking. You know, we're doing more with that event horizon telescope. We're adding more and more telescopes to that. We're doing more with gravitational waves, getting more sensitive instruments to learn more about that and to really see more about the mysteries of the universe and these bizarre and captivating objects that are black holes. So we are more than out of time. <laughs> so let's take some questions. Let's see. We had, we had one that was pre-submitted um, from Michael from Boulder who wanted to know how do black holes evolve? We talked a little bit about how they're made, or at least the stellar mass ones. When it comes to the supermassive ones, that one's a little bit trickier. Um, but as far as how they keep going, they kind of eat material as it happens. And they don't, as far as whether, how they die, you know, the same way stars die, everything dies, black holes are kind of tricky. Uh, what we believe happens or could happen is something called Hawking radiation which is just radiation from that black hole that could eventually make it disappear, dissipate it. But that would take trillions of years for that to happen for even really small black holes, which is kind of past how long the universe is supposed to keep going. So they're kind of indefinite as far as, as, far as we're aware. Yeah, especially if they have more stuff they can keep eating. Um, one of the more interesting things I've heard once from a professor at the University of Colorado Boulder was that black holes, when galaxies merge and collide, like in the Virgo supercluster we're looking at here, you can see just how tightly packed these galaxies are and that these uh, are inevitably going to be merging together, colliding. And the black holes can actually uh, not only spiral in and collide and form gravitational waves in a bigger black hole, but they can also eject each other. Sometimes ma supermassive black holes or black holes will collide when galaxies collide and one of them will get thrown out or sometimes both of them will get thrown out of the galaxy and become rogue meaning that they just kind of leave their home galaxy completely. So that's not really an evolution of the black hole itself, besides that it's no longer in its host galaxy. It's now roaming through space, going off who knows where. Got a rogue black hole. So we had one from Jennifer who wanted to know, does the structure of atoms change when they're in a black hole, or is it just that the atoms pack more densely? So actually, at that point that you are sending matter into the black hole, it ends up as it gets to the center of being transferred into energy, um, not necessarily atoms, and it loses that structure of being in like atoms or molecules or anything like that. Um, so it's not just that it's packed more densely. The thing is that the matter, the mass there was packed so densely that it just turned into like a puncture, a singularity, like a single point. So it just really turns more into energy as opposed to atoms. Yeah, I would add that uh, it just, the way we usually describe it is it rips them apart. Like atoms themselves can't maintain their coherency. They just kind of, they just get ripped apart inside of a black hole and become energy like Ramey said. So that leads wonderfully into Shelley's question who says, what happens if you fell into a black hole? Spaghetti time. So a few things happen if you were to go into a black hole. As you get closer and closer to this black hole, the same way that that immense gravity affects space it affects time as well, like we said, space-time. It actually means that your time starts slowing down. So while you're looking at your clock and you're thinking time's passing normally, 
someone far away would be looking at you and saying, why is, why is Shelly moving so slow? It's because your time appears slowed down. You would be looking at them and thinking, why are they moving so fast? What's going on here? By the time you get close to that event horizon, like past the point of no return, if it's a stellar mass black hole, that's it. <laughs> We've got spaghetti. It's called spaghettification. It's the word that I couldn't say earlier. Your atoms end up getting stretched out. And the reason for this is the difference between the gravity at your feet and the gravity at your head. So remember how it depends on distance. So if you're closer to something more gravity, further from something less gravity, that gradient, that difference for a black hole is a lot more than just being here on Earth. So you're getting pulled a lot here and just kind of less so here and you end up getting stretched out. And the technical term really is spaghettification. That's not just a fun word we said so that we can put a plate of spaghetti on a picture of a black hole. Um, so that's what would happen to you. It wouldn't be very pleasant. <laughs> With a supermassive black hole though, that gradient, that difference isn't quite as immense even though it does have more mass, which means that you could make it past that event horizon before you get pulled apart like that. So here I'm gonna try to stretch this to see if we can spaghettify this astronaut ourselves. Oh, defo. There we go. <laughs> Bye, Shelly. You've been stretched out. I guess you said if you fell into a black hole. I guess that's me. All right. So if there are any other questions, go ahead and pop them in the chat. Um, we'll make sure we turned off the slow mode. Mm -hmm. There. We've got Denise wanted to know what's on the other side of a black hole. Interesting question. Um, so there's this concept in sci-fi that people talk about a lot. Um, you've probably heard of it if you've watched a single anything with sci-fi, which is wormholes, which is you go into this black hole and then you're spat out on the other side of the universe or galaxy into another um, thing here. Uh, a white hole is usually what they call it that spits everything out. That's the idea of a wormhole. It's just like a bridge between space. Um, as far as whether or not that's true, you can do a lot of math magic and fedangling to make it work, but it's not something that's like physically possible or plausible to have happen. You have to make sure that one, you actually survive through there. Remember I talked about spaghettification. We talked about those atoms eventually being just converted into energy um, at the center. So you have to actually live through it or get anything through a black hole. So there's a lot of weird math happening there um, to get out to the other side. Um, so we don't believe that there's any sort of wormhole or that there's something like on the other side of a black hole. We think it's just, it's just a hole. You're just there. That's where it is. Um, it'd be pretty neat though. And if it turns out they are real, then you can come after me and tell me I was wrong. But as far as we know, it's, it's not a thing. I can add that um, some scientists believe that the stuff that falls inside the black hole is getting swished around. It's not just like it goes in and it's just gone forever, but that there's still stuff happening on the inside. We can't prove that because, well, maybe we can never prove it because nothing can escape. No information can leave a black hole. But if we assume that the same thing that physics still applies on the inside of a black hole, something going inside, we get swished around so much that it actually begins to gain infinite energy and that energy begins to represent something like big bang levels of energy. And some scientists think that this means that black holes could potentially be the births of other universes. And since they're separate from our own, we can never uh, take something from inside to back out. We'll never know, but it also means that uh, it kind of resembles our own universe. Our own universe ha kind of has that principle, which is that our information from our universe can't go into other universes. So maybe we're inside of a black hole. That's been one of the more interesting uh, offshoots of black hole um, theory. I think that's one of the reasons black holes are so exciting. You get these really crazy concepts like Nick was just talking about, like just wild theories like that, wild things, because you just, you just don't know what's really happening in a black hole. Does physics hold up? Is it something different? They're really cool. You never know. Uh, we've got another question from Ari Sprite who says, is the black hole in Interstellar realistic at all? And we actually have the picture pulled up right here, right? This is the one from Interstellar? 
Yeah, this is, uh, yeah. I think, Gargantua is its name. Yeah, Gargantua is what they called it. Um, so there's a lot of the black hole in there that's actually really realistic. So remember how we went through that event horizon and didn't get spaghettified. I talked about that with supermassive black holes. That doesn't happen. You can make it pass. You've got this huge accretion disk around there, and you can see the opposite side of the black hole. We saw that in that little video where light from the other side can actually come up over and under. So what you're seeing is the accretion disk following around like we have in those drawings. But because the black hole is moving that light, is making the light have those really curved paths, we're seeing the other side. What you don't see in the image is that the part of the accretion disk that's moving toward you is going to be much brighter. And it's going to actually be blue shifted a little bit. And the part that's going away from you is going to be much dimmer. Um, they thought about doing that actually in the movie. And then they said, well, it doesn't look very cinematic now. So <laughs> they knew that that was something that they did wrong, but they just thought it looked cooler this way. Um, as far as planets go, that's kind of a tough one. Um, the thing about that time dilation, you know, when they go down to that planet and the time over there is moving much faster and they come back in years have passed, um, that's, you know, realistic. You get closer to that black hole, you end up with a lot of time distortion, that time dilation. Um, as far as the planets actually surviving going around that black hole, um, very unlikely because as we were talking about earlier about those accretion disks and how energetic they are. Um, there'd be a lot of radiation. Those wouldn't be great planets to build any sort of civilization on because you have so many X-rays and gamma rays, just a bunch of radiation. So unless you've got a really intense <laughs> magnetic field, I don't think those would be good planets to move Earth to. We've- and, uh, Kip Thorne, the one we mentioned earlier who won that bet against Stephen Hawking was the one who really, uh, gave them great advice cinematically on uh, creating the black hole for interstellar and to his chagrin they like maybe said uh, didn't make it perfect they decided to make it look a little bit too a little bit more cinematic than they needed to to be fair that's what you got to do sometimes in movies make it a little cinematic i mean there's also the whole he went in the center and suddenly it was like a mirror into his daughter's bedroom i don't think that's what's in a black hole, but I guess we can't go down there. Maybe there really is, um, you know, a, a hole over to Matthew McConaughey's fictional daughter in the center of a black hole. We just don't know. I don't think so, though. So you can mark me down for that. <laughs> We've got another question from Colin who says, uh, we often talk about the singularity at the center of a black hole and that infinite density is what causes the hole. How did the Big Bang singularity expand if it was that dense? Man, you're really going, you're really going <laughs> for those questions, Colin. Ooh, that's a great question. That's a that's a big question there. That yeah. is a really big question. Those are big mysteries that cosmologists are working on, and is far above my pay grade as a as an astronomy student. Um, it's it is a big question on how exactly the Big Bang instigated and began and began expanding. Um, maybe Nick has some better information than above my pay grade and mystery. <laughs> there is no simple answer that won't lead to more questions, but uh, one of the simpler ones I can describe is that some, in quantum mechanics, you can sort of violate a little bit of uh, the which way, which direction time flows, and so some uh, cosmologists speculate that perhaps uh, some quantum mechanical particles could go back in time from the moment immediately after the Big Bang happened and trigger the Big Bang to happen. Um, and that's a very strange thing. Perhaps more, <laughs> yeah, perhaps more uh, simple to say is that inside the universe are black holes that obey the physics of that universe. So they're different in that way. The singularity of a black hole would obey the physics of the universe it's in. As with the singularity of the black of the universe itself, um, we have no clue what sort of physics it necessarily obeys besides that we know what happened after the fact. Colin, you should go into cosmology and then tell me the real answer. You can go ahead and, and figure that one out for us. There's and then you can podcast. do a whole stream about, <laughs> about how the universe began. Uh, but that's a really more, amazing question. Roger Penrose was on a podcast, I think, with like Brian Greene. Um, Roger Penrose is the foremost black hole scientist on Earth right now. Um, so uh, you can listen to his two and a half hour diatribe about black holes and cosmology and uh, Perhaps it'll give you the questions and answers you're looking for. Absolutely. 
So we are definitely out of time. So we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up here. Um, if you have any other questions, I have some excellent news for you. We have decided to continue our Dome to Home series. It's not gonna be Friday at four anymore though. It's gonna be Tuesday at two. And we're gonna be actually starting this coming Tuesday next week. Um, it's going to be summer campfire constellations. I'll be there. I believe Amanda will be there and we'll be telling you all about what constellations and stars you can find in the sky this summer. Um, so when you're out at night, whether that be in your backyard or the backwoods, you can go ahead and point out constellations to whoever you're with um, and really see more about the universe and understand more about what we're looking at when we look in the sky. So thank you so, so much for your continued support throughout this run. We have loved talking to you, conversing with you, answering your questions, and having a great time on these streams. And we love being able to communicate our passion and seeing your passion as well, even while Fisk is closed. So be sure to subscribe to this channel, turn on notifications to get alerts for more videos like this, like that one next Tuesday and all the other Dome to Homes um, throughout the summer. Definitely keep an eye out for summer events uh, by following Fisk on social media. We're going to have more of those Dome to Home videos. We're going to have social media challenges. We're even going to have a podcast. So stay up to date on that. Um, and again, thank you so much for following along with us. We've had a blast and are really looking forward to the summer. Thank you so much, everybody. It's been a pleasure to navigate for you on stream. And if there are other people you know who would be interested in this, please let them know about our upcoming streams and our podcast. Absolutely. And don't forget to share. Thanks so much, everyone. Till next time. Bye. Bye.